Hello, and welcome to this SRC Learning Essentials series video about MTU and Layer 2 services. If you are not familiar with the Service Routing Certification Program, you can learn more by visiting our website at www.networks.nokia.com src. In this video, we will first introduce Maximum Transmission Unit and discuss why it is such an important factor to consider when dealing with Layer 2 services. Once that is completed, we will move to our lab environment to complete an MTU case study. Maximum transmission unit is defined as the maximum frame size that is permitted over a certain link or service. This is extremely important in layer 2 services because fragmentation is not supported, which means any oversized frames will simply be discarded. Because of this, it is essential that MTUs in layer 2 services are configured according to the service requirements. Now, for an IP MPLS network, we need to consider four key MTUs. The first, of course, is the service MTU, followed by the SAP, SDP path, and network port MTUs. So let's move on and look at these in more detail. Service MTU is the maximum customer payload that can be carried in a service. The default value for a Layer 2 VPN service is 1514 bytes which is actually the size required to carry a standard Ethernet frame. The frame includes a 1500 byte payload and a 14 byte data link control or DLC header. Notice the frame check sequence or FCS is not included as it is simply recalculated at the far end. The SAP MTU is actually derived from the physical access port MTU and includes any VLAN tags arriving at the SAP. However, it is important to note that VLAN tags by default are service delimiting, which means they are stripped at service ingress and therefore not maintained through the service. Because of this, we can conclude the SAP MTU must be greater than or equal to the service MTU plus the VLAN encapsulation. A physical access port can be configured for one of three encapsulation types and each will set a different default SAP MTU size. A port that is configured with null encapsulation sets the default SAP MTU to 1514 bytes. Dot one q encapsulation, however, provides four extra bytes for a single VLAN tag, which increases the default SAP MTU size to 1518. Q&Q encapsulation encompasses two four-byte VLAN tags, bringing the default SAP MTU size to 1522. The SDP path MTU is the maximum payload size that can be carried in the SDP transport tunnel and by default is actually derived from the network ports. This MTU value is calculated by subtracting the encapsulation overhead of the transport tunnel from the egress network port MTU and it must be greater than or equal to the service MTU. So let's take a closer look at how the SDP path MTU is calculated. If an SDP egresses on a gigabit Ethernet port with an MTU of 9212, what is the SDP path MTU value? Well, that answer is based on whether the SDP is using either MPLS or GRE encapsulation. For MPLS encapsulation, we start with the network port of 9212, subtract 14 bytes for the Ethernet header, Subtract 8 bytes for two MPLS labels, which gives us an SDP path MTU of 9190 bytes. For GRE encapsulation, we again take the 9212 bytes, subtract 14 bytes for the Ethernet header, subtract 20 bytes for the IP header, subtract 4 bytes for the GRE header, and another 4 bytes for the service label to give us an SDP path MTU of 9170 bytes. Also keep in mind that when performing these calculations, you must consider any other factors that increase the encapsulation overhead. For example, facility backup or LDP over RSVP each require an additional MPLS label. So if both are used together on the same LSP, you would need to add an additional 8 bytes of encapsulation overhead. 
Next, we will move to our lab environment to perform this ePipe MTU case study, and there we will have the following setup. An ePipe with the service ID of 50 is configured between PE1 and PE2 and currently supports a maximum customer packet of 1514 bytes. The customer devices CE1 and CE2 are connected to the PE nodes using .1Q encapsulation and the SDP between the PE routers is using RSVP signaled LSPs. We are now required to configure ePipe 50 to support a maximum customer packet size of 5000 bytes. OK, so here we are in our lab environment. Let's start by looking at the configuration of the ePipe service on PE1. Using the show service ID 50 base command, we can quickly see that the service MTU is configured as 1514. Now, our requirement states we must increase this to support a customer packet of 5000 bytes. However, before we do this, it's best to increase the SAP and STP path MTUs first, as this will ensure the least amount of downtime for the service. Down below, we can see that the STP path is currently configured with an MTU of 9190. Remember that by default, the STP path MTU is calculated from the egress network ports. So by running show port 11, we can view port 112, which is our network port, and see that it is configured with an MTU size of 9212. RSVP LSPs are being used for the transport, so we can subtract 14 bytes for the Ethernet header, followed by 8 bytes for the MPLS labels, to give us the 9190 bytes that we are seeing for the STP path. So this value is much larger than the new required service MTU of 5000, meaning we can simply leave the STP path MTUs as is. Next, we need to view the SAP MTU sizes. And by running show service ID 50 base command again, we can see the SAP is currently configured with an MTU size of 1518. The SAP MTU is derived from the physical access port MTU. So we can run show port 11 and see that port 111 is currently configured with .1Q encapsulation and of course the same MTU of 1518. Now to support a customer packet of 5000, we must increase this port MTU size to 5000 plus 4 bytes for the one VLAN tag in .1Q which equals 5004 bytes. So to achieve this I can run configure port 111 Ethernet MTU 5004. Then I can move over to PE2 and run the same command. Configure port 111 Ethernet MTU 5004. Once that is done, I can confirm that it is changed on the SAP by running the show service ID 50 base command again. And here I can see that this app is changed to 5004 and running it one more time on PE1 will show me the same. Okay, so now that we have addressed the STP path MTUs and SAP MTUs, we can proceed with increasing the service MTU size. So here on PE1 I can do this by running configure service ePipe50 service MTU 5000. And I'll run the same on PE2. Configure service ePipe 50 service MTU 5000. And once that's done I'll confirm. So show service ID 50 base. And here we can see the service MTU is now changed to 5000 as well as our SAP and STP binding is up and operational. So back one more time over on PE1. So there is our 
service MTU successfully changed to 5000 and our SAP and SCP binding up and operational. Okay, the required configuration is completed. So we can now test the supported packet size by executing a ping between the CE devices. To test that the service supports a customer packet of 5000 bytes, we will need to set the ping packet size to 5000 minus 14 bytes for the Ethernet header, minus 20 bytes for the IP header, minus 8 bytes for the ICMP header, which equals 4958 bytes. So moving over to CE1, I can run ping 192.168.1.2, size 4958, do not fragment. Now the do not fragment option assures the packet is not fragmented if the packet size exceeds the service MTU. So it is very important in this instance. I execute that and we can see the ping returns a successful response and therefore proves that the service supports customer packets of 5000 bytes. However, it does not prove that 5000 is the actual maximum size supported. So to test this, I can send a second ping, but this time making sure to increase the size by 1 to 4959, and we would expect that to fail. So ping 192.168.1.2 size 4959 and again do not fragment and execute and there we can see it failed with timeouts and therefore proves that the maximum customer packet size supported in ePipe 50 is 5000 bytes And that about does it for this video on MTU sizes and Layer 2 services. Thanks for viewing and see you next time. Content for this video was adapted from the Nokia Services Architecture course. You can access the complete course via any of the three learning formats shown on this page, as well as get remote private access to a service router lab to complete the course lab exercises. If you are interested in obtaining an SRC certification, this table identifies the recommended courses and required exams for each of the five available certifications in the program.